Hey everyone, welcome to another James Who Live. Tonight we are having the wonderful Catching His Fire Ministries. Brian Prickett will be on here. Evangelist Brian Prickett will be sharing some great thoughts as we do this interview with Christine. This is going to be a wonderful time right here tonight on James Who Live. Evangelist Brian Prickett. Uh, the interview that we had, it's just an amazing opportunity. What an honor and privilege to spend time with such a great minister that has moved throughout the mountains and valleys of his own life to see, you know, reaching one person at a time with the gospel of Jesus, winning souls, taking the gospel to the world. He's going to talk about his transition from, you know, what he's doing with his ministry. We bring up different topics and things that are happening in this world. Stay tuned tonight. You will be blessed in Jesus name. Well, I would like to welcome everyone today to another episode of what I'm going to call like a fireside chat. To one side of me, I have Christine, my good friend from Global Missions Vision. To the other side, I have the wonderful honor and privilege of bringing one of my great mentors and friends, Catching His Fire Ministries, Brian Prickett. What we're seeing on Clapper, what we're seeing in Oklahoma and across the United States is just an amazing opportunity to see God use you and everyone else as we're in this pinnacle focal point of what's happening in America and what's going to happen as we pass the torch to the next generation, what the current generation and our elders are doing as we're seeing revival happen all over America, from Oklahoma to Florida to Tennessee to Kentucky to California. Things are happening amongst the nations, but at the same time, we're seeing a large amount of Christian persecution, not only in third world countries, but even here in America. I want to cover these topics today and go through these different moments, and I want wanted to start with a question, Brian. What is the most recent thing that you have been seeing that's happening there in Oklahoma and abroad that God has been using you to reach America and reach the youth and reach everyone else? What is going on? What's happening today? Man, uh, we're just in a place where we are trying to get people to understand of who they are in Christ, you know, their identity, because so many people can get saved. And it's like it says in second, I think it's second Corinthians uh one seventeen, it says the preaching of the cross is for those who perish foolishly, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. You know, so many people get saved, but they continue to walk in that that doubtful mindset of perishing and never come to a place of knowing that they are a son and a daughter in in the household of God, that we're we're no longer, you know, uh where we were born as uh, the the sons of Adams, pretty much. We are now the son of the father, and we need to walk into that identity that we are co-heirs, that we're not just a bunch of orphans going from here or there, that we are co-heirs setting with Jesus in heavenly places, and we should walk in that authority is what what we are seeing, you know, here. I believe that's completely correct. That we are the head and we're not the tail. That we have we have this kingdomship that this our fa heavenly Father wants to give to us and bring to us to set us free from the captivity of sin and the and the shackles that were once part of our old lives. Many people may not have a horrible background, but they're shackled by the sin. By the wages of sin is death. And when people have that empowerment to understand what God has done to set us free by the power of the Holy Spirit by the blood of Jesus Amen. Christ, I believe that opens doors and capabilities for people to walk into things that they could have not done on their own i believe that's Amen. what's happening that's breaking off of youth that's breaking off of current generations and elders all across america as people are wanting to turn around and make a decision to want to follow god we're looking at kat mondi who's who re repented of witchcraft and now she just recently what she just got baptized she's been saved she's wanting Amen. to do different things what is going on with this is because people are realizing there is a heavenly father there is uh, King of King and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, who wants to set us free. It, it is taken, it's taken me aback to looking at one of the first revivals where people were starting to pray for the generations and providing services and doing goodwill into the community. I think that's what's breaking these bonds off is they're seeing a love that goes beyond understanding of the logical mind. It's mind blowing. It's Christ flowing and it's setting these captives free. Amen. Amen. And the other question I wanted to leave to that about setting these captives free 
What what do you think it takes to get a person to that point? Man, to get to get a person to the point of being able to walk in their identity is knowing that they're no longer tied to their past. See, what I, what I love about Paul is when he brought up sonship in Romans, he was bringing it to the, to the Roman adoption ceremony. And when people, you know, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anybody be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things become new. And that new word in the Greek is kindos. It means brand new. It's not just new as I got it. It means it ain't never been opened. It means as if I ain't never sinned. If you have never sinned, and when he Amen. brings up that sonship, when he brings up that sonship, he's saying that you're you no longer have ties to your old father, but you now are tied to your new father, the adoption into the household of God. And what that represents is why Paul talked about sonship in the in the adoption ceremonies in Roman is because when you was adopted by a new family, they ripped your birth certificate up. So the old family could never trace who you were again. Mm -hmm. So you had no ties to them. And everything that the new father that adopted you was yours, no matter how long you've been into the household of God. Everything was yours just as if it was, for an example, was the Jews. What was the Jews is now ours as Gentiles coming in as an adoption. We're no longer tied to what we were. That birth certificate is being ripped up, and God has written a new one that says he's mine. She's mine. And that's how, you know, getting somebody to understand that what has happened in the past and letting it go and moving into their future identity of who they are in Christ. So many people don't understand that once you are covered by the blood of Jesus, you're covered by the blood of Jesus. That's the powerful thing about his blood. I love the word justify in, in righteousness. And if you look it up in the Greek, both of those words are the kind notes. So his father saying, I do both. I justify you and I give you my righteousness. I just need you to stay in the vine so you can produce the right fruit because you can't do nothing to part from me. So it's just being with him and knowing that even when we make mistakes, the confessing, changing our mindsets and renewing it daily and keep moving and not get caught up in I messed up in that shameful shame and regret. I did this, I did that. And that's what I feel a lot of people deal with because we need, we're in a generation where we need to learn to pour into people. Not just point them to something, but show them something. Show them how to follow the ways of Christ instead of pointing them to that. And they're not fighting with their own shame and guilt and regrets and, and the things that they, they deal with as a born-again believer. I believe that we, we need to get them to the point of understanding that, hey, you're a blood-bought servant. You're a, you're a blood-bought child and son of God, daughter of God. Now you just got to change as you go and it's through the process. And that's the one thing that so many people want to keep the shackles on their minds and their lives is they don't realize that they want to focus in on, well, these people won't accept me or this situation isn't going to change or I can't do this fast enough. If we think again, like you were bringing up with Paul, where he said, I boast in my weaknesses because Christ strengthens me through my weaknesses and overtakes right. this. And if people would realize that whatever you don't have, whatever you lacking in your life. God's supposed to go in and fulfill those things in your life and transform you by the renewing of your mind, by the renewing Amen. of your faith. This is a daily walk with Christ. This isn't like I just grab some kind of pill. I take the pill and, you know, that's it. It's a daily <laughs> walk with Christ. You're fighting Amen. against these things that are happening in this world. And that focal point change like you talked about. There's people that are currently in our lives. That if they knew us in our past life, they wouldn't recognize us the same. There's many people, many of us, all three of us could think about that if we went back 10 years, 20 years ago and met somebody that we haven't talked to for the last 10, 20 years, would they recognize who we were? Would they want to remember what we did in middle school or in high school or, or what we did on the street or what we did somewhere else? Many of those people will be able to bring up those, recall those memories. But where are you at today? 
The shackle is in the mind of the Amen. memories of the things that happen. What causes the person to not want to get saved is they're turned off by it because the Christian has made a mistake and they're focusing on what that Christian has done and said, well, that guy did this to me. That church did this to me. I'm not going to go. Instead of focusing their focal point on Jesus Christ, that's what you should be looking at. Not the people, what the people do. You need to look at what Jesus said, and then you'll get set free. You'll have that revelation of who God is, and he will transform you. We are not who we used to be. Even all three of us here today, we are not where we were 10 years ago, five days ago, or even last week. And when you walk into that concordance with Jesus, and you're in that fellowship, kingdomship with God, it's a daily walk with him, and it's renewing and transforming because we want to become – I was listening to a minister the other day. Uh, I think his name is Mike McCoy. He was talking about, I want to get fat with Jesus. And he was saying, <laughs> it's like not fat, like, you know, like my weight fat. He said, I want to get fat with Jesus. I said, what do you mean? Faithful, he says, accountable, and teachable. He said, he said I, want to, I want to get so filled with the Holy Spirit and what God is doing that my spiritual life is fat. And he started reading the Bible about fat, found all these different verses about fat, and that you're supposed to get full of God. When you, That's why the song talks about more of him and less of me. When you become kingdom-minded— it's kind of like, what do you do with the time of day that you're having and what's going on? And I, I wanted to ask you that next question. What does a person have to do to want to get to that point, to have less of them and more of God? What, what should their life consist of, Brian? Man, you know, the scripture said, I don't know exactly where it, at, where it is, but it says, I think it's in Philippians, but it says that it's God's power that creates in us to have the passion to do his perfect will. The issue that we have is when we start having that urge or that desire or that encouragement or that inspire to, to go and seek the Lord, we need to move with urgency. We need to have that devotional time, man, because God doesn't move within us. It's him where we have our, our being. Everything we do, we move in him and we have our being. And if God is, is tugging and he's pulling you and he's encouraging you and he's inspiring you, we need to act on that because he wants to speak to us. And I believe that that's what we need to do is we need to come to that point where we say, OK, God is trying to take me to a place where there's less of me and there's more of him. And how do we do that is being intentional we have to be intentional with our time we have to get up in the morning and we have to say you know what i'm doing things different today i'm getting up at five o'clock in the morning i am going to spend an hour in prayer i'm going to spend an hour in listening and i'm going to spend a you know an hour in reading here's the deal maybe maybe people don't have the time like that but here's the deal if you're going to pray 10 minutes listen 10 give god equal time and watch him begin to speak to you. And if he doesn't speak to you in the extra 10 minutes that you give him back, be patient. Wait 72 hours. Maybe God's waiting to speak to you. But so many people get discouraged. Well, you know, I prayed 10 minutes, but then they don't listen to him because they – have you ever had somebody let, – let me say I call you and I say, hey, I'm having all these issues. This is what's going on. But as soon as I'm done, I hang up on you. Like, I didn't even wait for a response or some knowledge or some wisdom. And that's how we do God, man. We go and pray for 20 minutes, and we're like a chatterbox. And then once we're done, we leave. And we don't never give God a chance or the equal time to respond to what we are asking or what he's wanting to do in us. Or we don't have the, the patience to wait. For a couple of days, maybe 72 hours, maybe whatever, just saying, okay, God, what, what, what about this? What, what are we doing? We're, we're as humans, we are, we are impatient human beings and we want, we want it right here and right now. And, and that's not how God works. God, God loves to spend time with us. And I want to encourage people when I say this, if you give God one minute of your day, he will take it because he loves you that much. Amen. And I look at this where I understand that those of you that are older, that are like around my age, I'm in about mid 40s. If you have like a high level executive job, you're working 60, 70, you know, 100 plus hours. You've got maybe 10 minutes of your day per day to do that. 
But look at all those others that are getting up at four o'clock, four thirty in the morning. What are they doing? They're going to the gym. They're getting ready to go work out, and they're not all athletes. Then you got other people that are that are executives. They're getting up at four thirty because they got to work on their presentation. They got to do a high level presentation. Those who are in school, you got to get your homework done. You got to get all that stuff done. It's a matter of priorities. Is watching your TV show a priority? Is playing your game a priority? Is going to the movies a priority? Going to the show a priority? What is important to you? And again, it's a one-to-one ratio, like you said, about how much you pray, how much you read. And if you don't understand it, find people. If you don't know anyone, ask us. We'll help you find people. We'll help you find a Bible. We'll help you find a place to go. We don't want you to be isolated. But at the same point, we can't be a crutch for anyone else either. You have to put in time to hear from God. So if you're Amen. just a Sunday morning, you just turn on the online thing or go in person and that's it. What about the rest of the days of the week? What about the rest of your time? You're not covered by that conversation with God. And yeah, you can have a burning bush moment, but God doesn't do burning bush with you every single day for their all the Amen. life. Amen. You have to get into that. You have to get in there. And again, for those of you that are newly Christians or those that have fallen away, you're all like, well, I don't know where to start. You start right where you're at with the time that you have. Look at your schedule. Look at what's going on and say, okay, God, what can I do? If it's just the driving in the car, you got to say, okay, thank you, Jesus. You know, I'm praying, God, we got to do what we got to do. Oh, good. Oh, good. Great. Thank you. You know, if you got to start there. You got to start while you're brushing your teeth. Thing you do, start with the time that you have. Some people can't multitask. I understand that. You're going to have to sacrifice Amen. a few things. So that's you the know, next I, thing. Mm-hmm. I've, heard, I've heard people say a sacrifice ain't a sacrifice unless it costs you something. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you got to be willing to, to, to sacrifice something that, that, that'll cost you. You know, you don't want anything for free. I mean, yeah, our salvation is free. But a lot of people just want something given to them. And and like I said, a sacrifice ain't a sacrifice unless it costs somebody something. And it costs Father God, the, the, the precious lamb, you know, to redeem humanity. So I, I believe that we should always want to sacrifice to hear the voice of God, you know, and, and that's getting into his presence. And so but yeah, uh, we, we have to be intentional with with with. I have a spiritual father that tells me this, what you put first, what you have time for is what you put first. <laughs> Amen. So, you, you know, so that's like a hit on the, on the chin when you hear that, you know? So, yeah. Exactly is. And that leads to the next point where we're seeing all this stuff happening. This is because of what all the elders are doing. This is because of the people that are putting in time for prayer. If you look at all these great revivals and all these that are happening, the ones that are happening in Tennessee right now, there's a Zoom prayer happening every day at 8 p.m. Eastern. Same thing happening with Asbury. What people are asking me and others to come and pray and stuff. Things have to happen. It's not like you just have a book in front of you and you open it and there everything just happens. There's spiritual warfare going on. The devil and his demons are trying to keep captive and operate in the time that you have to waste your time, to waste what you're trying to do, so then you're not operating in kingdom mind authority operations of what God wants to do in your life. If you want God to transform your life, you have to give him everything that's in your life and everyone that is in your life and the time that you spend, the intentional opportunities of what you're doing. And that requires a sacrifice. That requires opportunities. There's going to be times that you're going to have to wait. There's going to be times you're going to have to figure out exactly what God's trying to do, which transitions to looking at the persecution that's happening. You don't see all the stuff happening in Israel. You don't see all the stuff happening in America unless something is shifting. There are two kinds of shifting happening right now in America. On one shift, we have a great revival. The next Jesus revolution is happening right now with young and old people across the spectrum. And at the same point, we have an extreme ideology that's going as dark as you can freaking imagine and it's dangerous and it's unbiblical and it's ungodly and it's straight from the core of satan how does these two warring factions frictional opportunities happen because who's who's in there in the spiritual warfare component who's in there doing what god 
wants something to happen. I know many people are speculating on where we are in the spectrum of the end of days, if we're there, we're not. That's not what this conversation is about. This is about what can you do right now, regardless of where the time of day is, regardless of the seasons of where it is and what God wants to do in your life, which leads to the next question, spiritual warfare. And I'm going to phrase it like this. Um, there have been many times in my life when I prepared for programs like this and others, there's things that have been distractions. I've had a bunch of weird stuff happen to me and you've had it too. Uh, I can tell you there's a lot of things that we've scheduled and try to do cyber attacks, uh, bank cards being canceled, you name it. It's happened. Weird people show up with the weird voodoo, witchcraft stuff. I've had it happen online and in person. And like I said, it's a distraction. But for those that are weary and wor worn out, what kind of encouragement do you have for those that are currently in the trenches following what God is trying to do? What message would you have for them for that? Where they're saying, I'm about to tap out. What, what, what do I do? Man, I look at it like this, that, you know, for a while, I would get distracted by a lot of things. And God began to tell me that, you know, don't get distracted. Keep your eyes on me. Keep, you know, I study things about where, you know, Paul said, I glory in my tribulations. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I glory in that. In the Greek word for glory, I can't say it, but it means to strut like a fine stallion with your head mm -hmm. up high. That's what it means in the Greek when it says glory in your tribulation. And, and this is where I'm at, man. It's in this, this is just the season I'm in and how I can encourage somebody is, it's hard to have a bad day when you know he's in control. You see what I'm saying? Like he's he's in control of what's going on around me, what's going on around the world, what is happening, and it's hard for me just to get in that place and that set of that that mindset that I want to tap out. What I begin to do is pray for knowledge and wisdom and understanding on what's going on, and and seek that way and. Because, I mean, even even some of the great apostles went through things that that was a hindrance to them that could have been a distraction. But their main focus was the kingdom. It was spreading the gospel, expanding the kingdom, spreading the gospel and expanding the kingdom. And I feel that is the same goal today. And if you are carrying that type of mindset that, man, I'm going to expand the kingdom the best way I can where I'm at and what I'm doing and things start getting crazy, know this, that if you're, if you're praying and, 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 you're, and, you're, and you're traveling and you're interceding for God to move on, on different behalves and, and, and souls are getting saved, know this, the enemy does not like a successful prayer or soul winner. So yeah, he's going to come at you. But when you see things like that, know that you are moving the kingdom in the direction that he's trying to stop. He's trying to stop with spiritual warfare. You know, he might even use people, but know this, our battle's not against flesh and blood. So man. that's that's when you can't you can't be distracted by the words of man. You can't be distracted by what people are doing, what they're gossiping about, what they're talking about. You have to keep praying, move on, love them, and keep doing what God has called you to do. Because at the end of the day, we all have a mandate. And if you're like I am, I want to achieve everything that he's called me to achieve with this one temple he's given me. Amen. And, and so so that's where I'm at is uh, don't get distracted, man. There, the distractions is to keep you from moving. That's how I look at distractions, keeping you from moving. Can they can they can they stall you for a little bit? Yeah. But don't get caught up in them. Keep moving, Amen. keep moving, keep moving with purpose. And mm -hmm. I like to use purpose because purpose means it's constantly unfolding. It's not a destiny. I ain't trying to reach a destiny. When I get to heaven, that will be my destiny. You know what I'm saying? Amen. But as on this earth, I want to fulfill the purpose that he's called me to. No matter what I got to go through, that purpose is constantly unfolding until I take my last breath and I reach my destiny. Amen. We're constantly should be moving. Yep. So, so if you look at the Greek word translated glory and Jesus prayer, that's doxa. So the verb, the verb form of that is doxazo, which is used in the same sentence. So if you look at that in the English, that's doxology, which translates to him of praise. 
So when we're talking about distractions and spiritual warfare, the Bible is very clear. God is very clear that you should praise him in the storm, that you should worship him, him in the midst of these things. And like we said just a minute ago, this is about our time. This is about our energy, about the things that God has put into our lives. The devil may not necessarily tempt you with extreme, you know, you know, crazy, weird things. He will tempt you to waste your time. He will tempt you to not do anything. <laughs> You may not yeah. verbally say, you know, a cuss word. You may not be looking at porn or anything or those extremities. Right. He will just find a way to just get you angry, find a way to get you sad, find a way to get you depressed. And if you don't have a negative emotion, he's just going to find a way to just keep you busy and a distraction. Like it, I was saying you know, earlier. It's powerful because you think about Paul when it says the enemy of Satan come and buffed at him. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because of the, the great revelations that the Holy Spirit was giving Paul. You know what I'm saying? Uh, sometimes the enemy comes to, to, to keep us in a place of humility. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? To a point of acknowledging who he is, our father, you know? And because so many people can get puffed up with knowledge and wisdom that they truly don't even, you know, under you know understand human humility anymore so mm-hmm. you know it's just like he was like you know when i look at that that revelation where he said i asked god three times to take it from me and he said my grace is sufficient i really believe that god is saying i am trying to get you just like i got paul but i am trying to get you while going through these things to understand who you are to understand that i had given you all authority through Christ Jesus. He gave he because of disobedience of one man, sin, death, sickness, disease, all that came into to, to the world. But the obedience of another brought all that the healing, salvation, the authority, everything that was taken from the beginning of time, Jesus redeemed. And I feel like he was telling Paul, I need you to walk in your identity. I need you to walk in the authority that I have given you. So my grace is sufficient. So overcome this, overcome this. And I think we don't understand that, that we have that more than a conqueror, more than an overcomer. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives within us. And until we acknowledge that, we will always be like, God, God, help me, help me. Don't get me wrong. We need to be like that. But we also need to know that regardless of where we are, he's with us. Regardless of what we're going through, he's with us. And that's how I look at that, too, you know, is God is wanting us to learn to to walk as men and women of God and not the immature uh, part of it, if that makes sense. Like it's time to grow up, pull your big britches on and and walk and know that your sins have been paid for. And I know you make mistakes and I know you have shortcomings and I know you have imperfections. You know, I know all these things. I, I'm your I'm Abba father. You know, I know you have these, but I need you to come on. I need you to come on. The call of God, the gifts of God are without repentance, without shame, without regret, without all that. I just need you to, to follow me and I'll do the rest. And, and, and that's why it's a relationship, you know. Uh, and I don't think a lot of people understand that is they get saved and they just want to do this complete sanctification like that. And that's not a one-time event, you know, when it comes to the the carnal nature. It's a process, changing from glory to glory, becoming more like Jesus daily, you know. Amen. Yeah. And and that's the other thing. You look at the image of the person holding on to the rope and their hand is bleeding and it's all swollen. And then there's the other person decided to let it go, which leads to the next little transition of, I know it's going to hurt. A lot of people use that phrase. When you're going to just expose the darkness or you're going to have a touch point about something going on. A lot of people try to look at a parental to a child. Okay, Jeremy, you're in trouble. Jeremy Michael Caverly, you need to come over here now. I'm like, okay, what do I do now? And then they're like, I saw that you took that cookie out of the jar. Mm-hmm. It's not that kind of thing. When Paul's talking about, I boast in my weaknesses. This is where you're going to Jesus to say, hey, God. I've already asked for repentance of my sins. Let's have the next conversation after that. These are my weak points. What can I do to make these no longer weak points? And he will first say, pray for your who? 
Pray for your enemies. Pray for the people that have hurt you. Pray for the people in your family, in your church, at your job, at your school. Pray for these people you don't like. Pray for these things you don't <laughs> feel in your emotions and start blessing them in Jesus' name in your prayers. God, send them a better job. God, send them a good steak to eat. God, give them peace. Don't let them have crazy kids run around their house. God, let their families get along. Let their spouse get along. Let them get good grades. Give them break, maybe whatever it is they need. And you start praying on this stuff against your enemies and they're no longer enemies and you start seeing them through the eyes of god and not the Amen. eyes of man you start hearing it from the ears of god not the ears of man and it transforms you to be more christ-like in your character and that's where that renewing and transforming is. but still just like paul said i have that thorn in my flesh these things that are going on we all have something that gets on our nerves whether you like to roll, you know, are you an over or under toilet paper roll person? Some people that yeah. freaks people out. You have a toilet paper roll and some people set the empty roll still there and they sit it on top and you show that picture and everyone's like, oh my God, they lose their minds, right? Yeah. We all have something <laughs> that gets on our nerves. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. But it's that conversation where it's not like the, okay, Jeremy Michael Caverly, you took the cookie again. You forgot to change the toilet paper. No, this is the conversation where you are trying to go before Jesus saying, I've already asked for forgiveness of my sins. I'm sorry, God, I've done these things. You've already gone through this repentance. Step. This is where you're having that next dialogue that a lot of people aren't learning about and having that conversation and doing that part. And that's what needs to happen. This is what sets people free. Amen. That's what transforms societies. That's what helps the underground church. See, the underground church understands this. And I get asked every single day and all hours of the day to join these meetings. And because of my current job, I've had to say no to a lot of stuff. But they're writing me on WhatsApp and on Facebook and an email. And they're sending this. They're praying for people I don't even know and stuff going on. And they're praying for the people that that destroyed the, the, the churches in India and Pakistan. They're praying for what's happening right now in Israel. And it's just mind-blowing to me. They're literally praying for the people that are killing their friends and relatives, but they realize this sense of urgency of why it needs to happen and what God can do in the midst of these moments. Amen. And which leads to my next point. If we're going through that intentional change, we're praying for our enemies, we're doing what God is wanting us to do, and people are having to transform life. We've already covered about what's happening for those that are weary. This next question is for all those that have made it to this point that still haven't made those decisions, that still don't know what you want to do with God, and you're still questioning and wondering, what are you supposed to do now? Some of you are having that focal point where you do want to get more involved with God. Others of you have already are teeter-tottering, deciding, well, this has gone on too long. I, I got to go. There's another group of you that's still undecided, which leads to this next question. And this is my next to last one. I think Christine's got a couple, too. If someone is so uncertain and we look throughout the Bible and we even think about, you know, the case for Christ where people say, you know, here I am. God reveal yourself. How does God reveal himself daily to you? Can you give me like five to seven examples of what does God do in your daily walk to reveal himself to you? Well, one, you know, creation, simply, you know, uh, he says that in Roman when Paul wrote, said you would, you know, see the, the handwriting just from creation itself, you know, getting up and, and seeing myself in the mirror, man. Knowing that I'm created in the image of God and I'm unique. You know, I got these veins. I got these eyes. I got this breath in my lungs, man. You know, how can you not believe that there isn't a higher power? Then you walk outside and, and I look at the, the, the air that scientists call oxygen, but I call it the breath of God. Because I look at it that way because from the beginning of time, he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. And he became a living soul, you know, he became a living person. So I look at, at that as God breathes on us every day, regardless of where we're at, regardless if we have changed the way we think and, and come into the finished work of the cross as Jesus, our Savior. He's still a gracious, loving, 
Father, even when we're orphans and we still get to breathe his breath. So I look at that. I look at my children. Man, I that that's probably the most that that I look at knowing that God is is there is is mostly through creation. Everything had to come from something. I mean, mm -hmm. you grab an apple, you see you grab an apple, you see God in it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, everything you see God in it. Nothing was created without God. So, I mean, I even look at this cup and I know that God gave some men a created idea to make it. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so that's some of the points that I can say is alone. The biggest one is creation and, and looking at myself and maybe looking at my fellow brothers and sisters uh, in, in, in the community around me. Man, look at that. That person is made in the image of God, even if they don't know Christ, even if they haven't come to know him. I still look at them as man. Look at God. God created them for a purpose and they just don't know it yet. Just get me excited, you know, mm -hmm. so uh that that's some of my points man and uh the biggest one is creation i mean you go out you look at the moon you look at the clouds you look at the stars you i mean i just i just you know it just takes me back to scripture that says only a fool will say there's no god i mean mm -hmm. you got everything you need to believe and you know i had somebody tell me one time this is another thing that i know that God is, is real and that he's there is people's like, you don't think you could be a good person outside of God. I said, no, you could, because that good that's in you, God put there hoping it would draw you that yearning. Like, why am I, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you could be a good person outside of that, but that's still from God. God put that goodness in you to want to do what is right. That's why it says, the, the, the law was written on man's heart, you know, when, when Paul talked about it, that a man would be judged according to what he knows and the law that's on his heart and stuff like that. So when you want to do good, that's God in you. That's God saying, that's that's my DNA. That's that's me, you know. So, yeah, that's that's some of the my points, I guess, of knowing that he's there, you know, changing. <laughs> I, 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 I think it I think it's. Uh important to understand your identity in Christ and the creation of the things that are around you and how that works together. So whenever somebody is questioning about their faith or they're questioning on making a decision to, to do something next and change into different ways, it opens up that door for, for God to move in such a way that it's undeniable, just like when we talked about, you know, people in our past that we may come across that knew us in other seasons of our life or maybe heard about something. And where we are today is not the same as yesterday. Creation. God is the author. He is the alpha and the omega. He creates the beginning and the end of everything. And he's the father of all things that exist. So if you're still struggling with something like that, God's going to reveal something to you for those of you that are still struggling after this broadcast god's going to reveal things because we've been praying into this others have been praying into this that those that hear these messages god will open the door for your life and it may not be through us it might be through somebody else it might be Amen. in person it might be online it might be in something in the mail someone might knock on your door i was on a tiktok the other night and this guy said uh he, he got, you know, got back into the church because somebody knocked on his door, you know, and they knocked on his door and they started having a conversation and actually brought stuff to him to help him out and, and pray with him and his family. And they got back into church. Other of you might be out and see like a big bouncy house and bring your kids and do something like that. You never know where God is going to show up. Which Amen. opens up so many different things and leads us to those next places and what God wants to do. Which leads us to this, God's not done with you yet. Amen. Even if you are a pastor or a minister or you were involved in witchcraft or you're involved in this, maybe you got involved in drugs, maybe, maybe you killed somebody. I don't know what it is you've done. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you lost your spouse. Maybe somebody died. I don't know what happened to you. God's not done with your story yet. Amen. God Amen. has another chapter in your life. And I don't know if Christine wants to go on this one about the next chapters of someone's life, or you want me to ask it. 
Well, so I was just wondering, uh, what gives you hope? Man, knowing that I'm I'm in his hands every day. You know, used to I used to struggle with, you know, what's going on in my life. What is my purpose? And I I was reading the Bible one day, and a Philippians four six just jumped off the page like it was a light. And you read it, it says, "Be anxious for nothing." But pray about all things, letting your requests be made known unto God with supplication and thanksgiving. And I was like, wow. So I've learned to 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 be anxious for nothing. When when I start seeing something come my way or uh, distractions or things that I'm that I'm at, that are out of my control, the first thing I do is cast all my cares upon him. And that's what gives me hope that he is true to his word. He is who he says he is. And. I just that's that's my hope is in him and and what he did for me and that that uh I can't have a I can have a bad day but it's hard to when I know he's in control of what is a I I think sometimes a lot of people have a hard time with changing their perspective mm-hmm. and 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 what man is meant for bad God is meant for good so Romans eight twenty eight all things work together for good for those who love God. And for those who are called according to his purpose. So I know if something's not right, something's, you know, uh, is coming against me, knowing that I'm in the will of God, that I know that I have to change my perspective. And that's what gives me hope. Just like when Joseph was sold off and by the, it, to the Egyptians, you know, and when it all was finished and done, there was a purpose why it happened. You know, he, he saved the nation, man. And he was Pharaoh's, you know, right hand man. And, when everything come down to it, he could have said, you know what? I'm killing you all. <laughs> but he mm-hmm. didn't. He changed his perspective and said, what y'all meant for bad, God meant for good. And I and I feel that's what gives me hope is that I'm able to change my perspective and know that God is doing something regardless if I see it or not. And that that's so important that um, – and there's, there's a certain seasonal way of saying this. For people to understand this clearly, we're not saying that all these bad things happen to you is great. We're not saying, you know, you should be excited, you know, that someone died or something bad happened to you. But God can use these different situations to help you overcome not only in your own life, but be an example to somebody else. Amen. That no matter what you've gone through. Like I said, my friends that are in, you know, persecuted church, you know, areas, whether it's India, Pakistan, Iraq, Iran, China, and elsewhere, what they always tell me is that when something bad happens, they say, uh, you know, many blessings to you when, when somebody does something wrong. And that was a practice over time that some of them said it took, you know, years to get through others it was just an instantaneous thing because they were in a household of christianity so it was easier but those of you that don't have that it's a practice to move to that point so when we go through things that are bad and and we lose situations and we lose people and other things happen we're able to thank god to helping us go through these things because we're not supposed to live in a sheltered little bubble Once you become a Christian, that doesn't mean the rest of the world doesn't happen anymore. It's how you respond to the world, to the situations that are happening to you. And you can bring a testimony of God's power that while you were weak, while you were sad, while you lost whatever, whether it was me being homeless or me being beaten or or with other stories of other people that have overcome things like domestic violence and, you know, other crazy, horrible things. What caused them to go through the adversity and move beyond it is because they had a hope. They had a plan in the future, like Jeremiah talks about, of what God wants to do, where he wants to lead someone to set them free. You don't see the promised land. You don't see the, the, the dividing water happen of the sea without God providing the opportunity. And I was talking to one of our elders today, and they were saying, God didn't remove and cause, you know, lot situation to happen or cause the ark to finally float away and for Noah to get away. He didn't cause, you know, what happened with the disciples after he left until he provided 
you know, something to happen, whether it was the ark or it was the Holy Spirit or it was something else. God provided a way for them to escape and it gets to a certain point. These things in our lives, that certain point that we have to experience, I'm not talking about end of day theology for there or not. We're going to be raptured away. But until that point, you must focus in on what the Holy Spirit is going to do. We have that comforter. We have that capability to have that communion with God through prayer, through fasting, through praise and worship, through reading his word, through fellowship with other Christians. We are not the James Bond, Navy SEAL, John Wayne, whatever you want to call it, (laughs) Marine, whatever person, you are not supposed to sit here and just sit in your underground bunker with your cool little toys and push the button and that's all you do and you just spend the rest of your life in the solitude. No. Although, yeah, there's going to be some Christians that are going to be persecuted and throw in prison and they're going to have to praise God in solitude, but that's not for everyone. That's not happened to us all. The rest of us are going to have to go through the world. What does the Bible say? We are of this world, but not of this world. We're living in this world. We're part of this world. We're part of this culture. But we're also at the same point. We are not of this culture because why? This is not our home. We should be looking forward to going to heaven one day. We should be kingdom minded. And not worldly minded. And to have that transformed mind requires putting in the work with Christ. So if you want to go through these storms of your life, because we're all going to go through different seasons. We we have an expiration date. These old bones have an expiration date. I'm not going to be here, you know, 150 years from now. None of us will. This broadcast might be, but we won't. What legacy will you leave? You know, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. What so what's uh, this is the question I'm gonna ask the both of you and you both can answer and I'll answer mine. So I'm gonna ask the question, I'll answer first. What do you want to be remembered for? And the only thing I want to be remembered for is he was a follower of Jesus. They can't remember specifics, at least they can remember that short little sentence. He he loved Jesus. And if you have an example, that's great. But if you don't, at least know that I love Jesus. So Brian, Christine. What do you want to be remembered for? Man, I just want to be remembered that I understood the assignment, man, that God placed me here for. You know what I'm saying? I want people to see Christ in me because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to represent him to a dark world. Wherever we go, we are presenting Jesus in their midst. And I want to be known that, you know what? I did all that God called me to with this mandate that he's given me by representing him well. That's what I I, I want people to say. He represented Jesus well. And that's where I'm at, man. That's what I want. Amen. Amen. And I would say the same. It's representing him well and just doing his will. It's not my will, but thy will be done every day and just drawing closer to the heart of the Father, asking for the Father's heart. Amen. And I know Christine Amen. has some issues sometimes, so we'll just give her a few moments to come back. But intentional about what, what God is doing. You know, I, I had a youth pastor, and I always love this story because it's something I'm reminded of. He, he had us go, he, had, he sent us to the graveyard. And uh, we walked around a bit. We talked about people, you know, focal points, you know, historical figures that were there because sometimes you know there's little plaques and we talked about you know the eulogy and the assignment was write your eulogy what are you gonna be remembered for you just died and of course some people took it serious others said stupid they said i want to remember for eating scooby snacks that's what one person actually wrote (laughs) another person said i will remember that i ate all the subway you know but, but beyond the funny stuff some people actually took the assignment serious Right. And that's the assignment I'm going to give every one of you tonight. What do you want to be remembered for? Amen. You know, what? what is it that God wants to do in your life? Where does he want to place you? And yeah, a lot of people are going to have their friends or family and others right now. You know, he's the son of blah, 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 blah. He went to this church. He's this age and this is who's left over. Forget all that. What do you want to be remembered for? What, 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 what would you want it to say down there? You know, follower of Christ? But if you have a eulogy, that's usually a page or two pages. 
You know, some people took it even further and they they actually wrote a, a eulogy that they gave to their their parents and their their brothers and sisters and extended family. Some people took it further and even made videos to say, I'm at this age, this is what I'm gonna do. And someone actually did this for the last 10 plus years of life. They made a video once a year. I said, This is what I want you to remember. And they did it for 10 years. And some of those people died that last 10 years. I'm not asking you to go that extreme. I'm just asking you to think about. What is, what is happening in your life? Where do you want God to take you? Where are you going to go next? What are you going to do? How are you going to get there? Because you may be 43 or 13 or 5 or 75 years of age. What is God saying to you right now? And every time you, you go and have that in the throne room moment, you go into your prayer room, in your prayer closet. God's going to give you a different answer. And some of you that are knuckleheaded, hard-headed, he's just going to keep repeating the same thing over and over again, which leads to the yeah. next thing. Perfect love casts out all fear. And many of you Amen. are still afraid. You've made it this far in the broadcast. You're not in doubt anymore. You're not uncertain. You are afraid of the things that have been in your life or the lives of others or what someone else is going to think. So, Brian, you want to touch and talk a little bit about fear? Man, fear, fear will paralyze you. Fear will keep you from ever moving into your God-given purpose. Fear will even keep you in an orphan mindset. Mm -hmm. because you never come to know who his perfect love is. And, you know, you talk about that scripture, those who are made perfect love do, do not fear, but those who fear have not been made in perfect love. And it says fear drives torment. And if you look at the word torment, it means physical and mental suffering. Mm -hmm. So the deal is, is if the enemy can continue to keep you in fear, that's why you got, see, I, I might step on some toes when I say this, but this is why you got so many Christians running around looking for deliverance because they think something's wrong with them. And it's fear that's driving them to believe that. Oh, there's something's wrong with me. There's something wrong. But they're born again believers. What a lot of people don't understand is, one, they haven't came to a place to understand his perfect love for them. So that's why they walk in fear. And that's why their mind is tormented. And that's why we must cast down all imaginations that exalt their self above God. What, what some people don't get is you can cast out a demon, but the flesh, the corner nature has to be crucified. You see what I'm saying? Like you have to die daily. And a lot of people don't understand when they get born again. They're dealing with this flesh and they're dealing with this mind. It's nothing to do with the demon. You might be oppressed. You might have somebody coming to buff at you, but that's because they're trying to keep you not to understand the perfect love and what the cross and what the blood of Jesus did for your life. So you walk around like an orphan mm -hmm. instead of walking into that overcoming, I'm dying to self, I'm, I'm crucifying my corner nature. That is the biggest Goliath that a lot of people will face in this life because I could go out and preach the gospel to people that's never heard it. Or people that never received it. And demons can come out of them. Because it said preach the gospel. Cast out demons. Heal the sick. I believe in all that. But I also believe when a person is, is saved and their spirit is renewed. A lot of their biggest Goliath is their carnal nature. And you can't cast that out. You have to put it to death. Amen. And so... So they, they, they fight with the fear that something's wrong with them. Like, man, I can't, I can't get away from this porn. I can't get away from this lust. I can't get away from this anger. We mm -hmm. have to die daily. We have to renew our mind daily. And if you look up the Greek word noose, it means mind, thoughts, and feelings. And every day we must make sure that we have kingdom mind. We must make sure that we have kingdom feelings and we must make sure that we are in the kingdom will that God has called us to. So that's what I look at when it comes to fear is uh, it'll paralyze you or keep you from moving and doing what God has called you to do. And it will torment you mentally. Mm -hmm. And it will also make you think something's wrong with you never accepting the full salvation and redemption that, that Jesus brought on the cross. So you got a bunch of people running around not knowing who they are in Christ. When they are in Christ, it makes me think about when Jesus went to the wilderness. He was, dri he was driven to the wilderness. And what did the enemy do? He tried to get Jesus to question his identity. If you be the son of God, 
if you be the son of God. And that's what a lot of people deal with when they get saved. Their carnal nature is going crazy. Paul explained it in Romans. He said, I feel like there's two people in war. They're, they're, when, when I want to do good, I end up doing the evil that's within me. You know, it, you have to die daily and you have to come out of the mindset that, that in this fear that God doesn't love you and that you have his grace even right where you're at fighting with this carnal nature. It's a process. We die daily. It, it's not going to change overnight. you got to accept this sanctification that is not a one-time event. And, and, and don't run from God when you have these fears. Don't run from God when you have these imperfections or sins in your life. That's the wrong thing to do is run in isolation. That's that uh, Adam and Eve syndrome. As soon as they knew they did something wrong, what did they do? They ran from mm -hmm. his presence. They tried mm -hmm. to sow fig leaves. And that's what we do when it comes to we fail. We made mistakes. Man, the fear sets in. We get tormented instead of truly believing what the blood of Christ did for us. And that, that's, that's so spot on because it's two different directions. Either you are ashamed and in fear of your sins or you're overly confident and zealous and excited about what you're doing in defiant of God. You're going to go another one way or the other. Some of you might be ignorant if you haven't been told, but there's not very many people that are <laughs> ignorant of the sins of God, especially those that are involved in like witchcraft, other things like that. Many of them own a Bible and can quote the Bible for you better than some Christians. Yeah. So they'll call you out on it faster than some Christians do. But fear will completely paralyze you in the boasting and the overconfidence direction of like, well, I can do whatever I want. It's just as paralyzing as well. Yeah. This is why you got to go before, you know, the throne of grace and go before God every day and, and, and not be afraid to, to present that to him. You know, you don't see people go to an altar call. that are scared. You don't see people that are boasting. They're scared. You'll see people walk out and leave that are that are boasting and, and scared. But those that are going forth and say, "I want to do this, Lord," it's because they're laying their life down. They're laying this situation down. They're laying those Goliaths. They're laying those strongholds down. Some of you aren't in extreme, you know, bondage like I had. To, I went through the deliverance, but they even said that before the deliverance and afterwards. They said, they said, if you have anything that you're boasting about or anything that you're afraid about. This is a, almost a complete waste of time. So I had to prepare before I went and I had to prepare after I left because it's not just a one stop shop with anything. Whether you go to an altar to get saved or have prayer, we got to continue to do this thing every day. It's like it's like taking your medicine. It's like, what is this? This is a glass of water. We all need water. Amen. If we don't drink water every day. What happens? We will dry up and die. You gotta have men. You gotta have food. You gotta get fat with the Lord, as I said earlier. You Amen. gotta do these things. You gotta move forward in what God is calling you to do. Because if you don't, you're you you're not getting in the boat. You're out of the boat. You're not gonna have the out of the boat experience. You're gonna sink. You're not gonna be in the boat and calm. You're not gonna be able to go through these things. Having yeah. faith is a step by step process. Some of you are going to have momentous faith. As soon as you get saved, you're going to have all these amazing things happen. And all this is going to happen. You're going to run with it, and you're not going to fall away. You're going to be this next great mega pastor. That's great. But not everybody's got that calling. We all have a unique calling. Amen. Which is the next question I wanted to ask about. People's calling. How do people walk into their calling, Brian? Man, that's a powerful question, man, because I believe wherever God has you at, you need to be the best at it. You know, if you look at the Hebrew word for ministry and worship, they are the same. Or, or work and worship, I mean, sorry. Work and worship are the same when it comes to Hebrew. So whatever you do in the marketplace, it, it's worship, it's work. And I believe that if you're a truck driver, be the best truck driver you can be. It said that God gave gifts unto man. You are a gift on this earth to present, represent Jesus in the, in the midst of the world. So wherever you're at, you get a lot of people say, I want to be in full-time ministry. I want to be in full-time ministry. My friend, you are in full-time ministry or you're a part-time Christian. And why I say that is because 
our calling is to the marketplace. This is how we build the kingdom. This is how we expand the kingdom. Because you got Jesus that made 130 appearances and 122 of those were in the marketplace. You got 52 parables and 45 of them had a marketplace context. And then he calls his 12 disciples, not from the temple or the synagogues, but he called them from the marketplace. So I want to encourage people that are listening to this right now, wherever God's got you, if you're a plumber, be the best plumber you can be. If you're a truck driver, be the best truck driver you can be. If you're a construction worker, be the best constructor worker you can be. Whatever, teacher, I don't care what it is. Be that tree planted right there for people to eat from, man. And when, when I look at this, Proverbs eleven thirty said, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. And those who win souls uh, uh, are wise. Here's the deal. Somebody's eating from your tree. You hear, I heard a man say this one time, preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, use your words mm -hmm. because your fruit, your fruit is going to preach louder than any look. You can produce looks. You can produce words, but if your fruit don't match, then it's not a good thing because people are eating your fruit off of the tree that you are presenting in wherever marketplace you are working or doing. And that's that's how I look at that, man, is you are called to expand the kingdom wherever God's got you. And if that's in a marketplace, in a workplace, then do the best you can do where you're at. And as he opens doors, then go through those doors, you know? So, and that's what I've had to learn, man, because being being called to being an evangelist, I don't like using titles because I believe in functions. Mm -hmm. People can carry titles all they want, but if they ain't functioning in it, then it don't speak to me, you know? So the deal is, is yeah, I want to I wanna function as an evangelist and I, and I want to go preach here and I want to go preach there and I want to stir up the body of Christ but also in this industry that God has got me in when it comes to construction or, or doing these certain things, I've learned to know that he is enough and I need to be the best I can be where he has me at. Regardless, we are called to the marketplace because Jesus did most of his ministry there. You're completely right. So if we look at the marketplace, one of the big studies that a lot of executives and others do, they'll use the Kaizen way and they'll go back and talk about the conversation about the Ford era and the Toyota era and when the assembly line happened. Now, I know this is, you know, too technical for some of you and I'll explain it a different way, but the body of Christ has seven to 75 experiences before someone gets saved. And sometimes that's from the age of seven to 75 before they get saved. So this is either seven to 70 individual experiences or from like the age of seven to the age of 75, multiple experiences. But look at it as an assembly line. We are all different parts of the body. The body of Christ means me and you, Brian, me, Christine, you, those that are on the, the, the technical background that are doing this stuff that are Christians, you're involved in this too, even though nobody sees you and hears you. We all have a different part. And yes, our seasons change. Sometimes we're the host. Sometimes we're the speaker. Sometimes we're the preacher. Sometimes, you know, we're the announcer. Sometimes we're behind the scenes in prayer and the roles change out. And other times we're just, in, just doing what God's called us to do. But when you put all the different players together, it's like a football game. If you don't have the kicker, you don't have the runner, you don't have the defense, and you don't have a referee, and you don't have an announcer, and you don't have a, a TV station or radio, you're missing out on the full spectrum of everything that can happen for an experience it's kind of like going to the movie can you think about going to the movie theater without getting what popcorn what you put in the popcorn most people are going to say butter right you want the whole experience right you want to understand the whole experience and to have the full experience of christ you've got to have the full body of christ participating and going beyond participating, they are serving, being vessels for the Holy Spirit to commit acts of worship continuously for all the days and hours of their life. And to do that is an amazing experience because you don't have an amazing evangelist like Brian and others be successful without everyone else that's involved in helping him. 
Amen. You don't have an amazing church. You taking over a church. You don't have an amazing church. If you don't go out in the marketplace and reach your community, your church is going to shut your door. And you're going to have to go find another church or you're going to have to go start working in the marketplace. It's the same for any one of us with any kind of job. If you don't put in the work and do what God has called you to do, you miss out on those opportunities. But if you are in the marketplace and you're not doing ministry like me and Brian and Christine do, that's okay. You still have the opportunity to pray. You still have the opportunity to worship him. It doesn't matter if you can't sing. You don't have to be on the stage. Amen. But there's still that opportunity. Many of you still have a testimony, and that's one of the things that fails the church is people aren't sharing their testimonies, regardless of what, what you're doing, whether you're the garbage man or you're the truck driver or you're the teacher or professor or the executive. You still have a story. Your your life is still important. Even if you don't have a bad story, I didn't, you know, well, Jeremy, I didn't overcome drugs and all this other stuff. So I'm, like, I'm not that important. There's still people like you <laughs> that need to hear your story because they're going to say the same thing that you just said about yourself. Well, there's nobody like me. I had a normal life. Ain't nothing wrong with me. I don't have no trauma. I don't need no pills. I'm fine. I'm making a lot of money. They still need to hear about what God's doing in your life. And you still need to pray for people. You still need to worship them. Even if you can't sing. At key in tune, it doesn't matter. Amen. You're still important where you're at because there's so many stories throughout the history of the Bible and throughout the history of my life and Brian's life that we can think of that a truck driver had an opportunity to help someone. I remember when I was a kid, our car broke down and an evangelist from another state actually changed the tire of my car, my mom's car. They exchanged phone numbers. He called me that week and prayed with me and that stuck for the rest of my life 30 years later we both probably could think of a tire scenario where we prayed with somebody maybe not maybe it's you know like one of my friends from canada that came through he ended up coming to kentucky and he ended up going to, out to eat with the speaker and I, I had to go back home just like one of my other ministers we both had to go home 12 years apart but same story we both had to leave i didn't get to go out to eat but at the dinner they're hearing the story of the, of the waiter talking to one of the other people and something was going on. He decided to stop eating. He got out of his chair, went across the room and said, can I pray with you? And interjected in the midst of the situation. There's going to be opportunities for you, the truck driver, for the, you, the teacher, the lawyer, the student, whatever you're doing to pray for things. If you're a truck driver, you get to pray over all the roads. If you're a garbage man, you get to pray <laughs> over all the home. I mean, you got to think of this in a different way. Amen. If you're in yeah. job, you get to pray for all the people that work at that job. That's the first thing. Wherever you're Amen. at, you get to pray for all those people. And then God's going to start telling you when to talk and when not to talk. Some of you aren't extroverts like me and Brian. You don't want to go out <laughs> and have the one-on-one -on -one dialogue with a lot of people. And, and guess what? I didn't start doing this when I was younger. I didn't want to do all that stuff. It wasn't until I got in high school and I started carrying my Bible. People started asking me. I didn't just start walking around like saying, oh, I want to do this. I want to talk to me. I want to talk to a crowd of 6,000 plus people. No, it doesn't just automatically happen. God gives you the power to do what you need to do. Some of you are going to be doing things that are unseen, that are not on social media. They're not being filmed. They're not being emailed. They're, there's no YouTube viral sensation video about what you did, but you prayed for this person. Maybe you donated or tied to a ministry. Maybe you helped someone out. Maybe you did something else. Changed a tire. Gave some advice. Offered a job. Whatever it is, think about it. Whatever you're doing in your life, it matters. There's significance Amen. in what you are in kingdom-minded business. And it starts with Amen. right where you are and who you are. Understanding your identity in Christ. And when you understand that, then you're going to walk in those moments. Whether you're a manager, a supervisor, you could be the cashier at the Chuck E. Cheese. I don't care what you are doing. God's Amen. going to transform your life. And, and you're going to have some of those moments where you'll share your testimony or, you know, you're praying for someone. You could be a bagger. You get to pray over everyone's groceries in that family. And you don't ever see them. You just see the person that's there. Think about what God can do. If you still don't have an idea of what God can do, why don't you take this moment to say, God, what do you want me to do for the kingdom? Jesus, how can I make a difference in someone's life? God, how can I surrender my life to you? When you start asking those questions, you start seeking the will of God, 
your will and your priorities and your things are going to completely change and your life will never be the same from that day forward. Amen. Amen. So at this point, Brian, with last words, Christine, you have any other last words? Uh, it's just a, a pleasure to be able to hear your testimony and just to hear how you're reaching the next generation. So thank you so much. Thank you all for having me. I enjoyed this. Thank you, Brian. Uh, for the final thoughts question, um, and this can go in any direction you want. If there's something you wanted to share about your testimony or something that's on your heart, this is kind of an open-ended question. Uh, final thoughts to wrap all this up. Uh, what the Lord leads you to share at this point, man. I just want to, uh, I just want to encourage people to understand that you got two types of testimonies, man. You got a testimony of what God has brought you out of, and you have testimonies of what He's going to continue to bring you through. And the reason we have those testimonies so we can always bring glory back to Him. Look, look what He's done for me. Look, look what He's continued to do in. You know, I've been serving the Lord for 22 years, and it hasn't always been an easy road. You know, I was a very rebellious kid. Uh, I gave my life to to Jesus 18 in a budget suite. I was rebellious. I was getting high. I wasn't in a church setting or anything like that. I just remember sitting at a table, and I started having these outer bodies experience. My heart started messing up. My grandpa was this old school Pentecostal fire and brimstone preacher. So, you know, it was able to always had the seed that he planted in me. And I remember going to that room and just saying, Jesus, I know that I don't live for you. I don't love you like I should. And man, it was like, it was like my life changed that day, you know, but I think what a lot of people don't understand as ministers, we have to stop putting ourselves on this pedestal. Like we don't go through anything. You know what I'm saying? I've served the Lord for 22 years, and two and a half years ago, God brought me out of a cave experience that I was in for five years. Man, I, I can go back and, and talk about times where I got out of church, and you know, a lot of people would say, oh, you backslid. No, I didn't backslide. I never, never put my faith into something else for salvation. That's true backsliding. You know, I always believed that Jesus was my Savior, you know, that he was my all. I just wasn't on the right path of what I needed to be. And, you know, I just want to encourage people that because, because you make mistakes or you fail, man, that doesn't, that doesn't keep the call of God on your life from not happening, man. That is the grace of God. And your failures is a reflection of his grace in your life. You know, I remember when I was not in church and I wasn't living like I should have, but I always had a love for the Lord and I'm, and I'm driving and I just had this encouragement to start worshiping, man. And I remember worshiping and, you know, I want to share this testimony with people because this was in my lowest state of my life, man. I felt like I was washed up. My calling was over. I was probably about 26 years old, 27. And I remember just worshiping God, man. And I started seeing these visions of all these people, man. And I was preaching the gospel to them. I was sharing the love and the goodness and kindness of God. And I remember some men of God that said, if you ever ruin your testimony, you've ruined your testimony. And I want to, I want to say this to somebody out there today. You can't ruin a testimony because God is the one building it. God is the one building that testimony so you can give him glory. And I remember driving and seeing those visions and I had tears in my eyes and I said, Father, I can't do that. I ruined my testimony. And these were his words to me. He said, whose anointing is it? I said, it's yours. It's your anointing. He said, I give it to who I'm pleased with. And at my weakest moment of my life, when other people would have put me down, they would have shamed me. They would have said, you're not a man of God. God said, I'm pleased with you. So I, I want to share that with people that sometimes when you think that you're at your lowest point and God can't use you, my friend, I want to tell you something. When he told me whose anointing is it? And I said, it's yours. And he said, I give it to who I'm pleased with. You might not be pleased with yourself, 
but he is pleased with you, man, because he understands you're human. It says in 2 Timothy 2.13, when we were faithless, he remains faithful because he can't deny himself. He can't deny the blood that covers your life, and he can't deny the robe of righteousness that covers who you are while you walk this relationship out with him, man. So even though when you're not faithful, he remains faithful. And that's, you know, what I have to share. So. Amen. 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 You, you know, it's God's not done with our story yet. No. Uh, and many of us are going to have a roller coaster of a story. We're going to have different seasons in our life. You know, Amen. I, I remember when I did more pseudo full-time ministry than what I'm considering now more like a part-time, but full-time, but it's different. Amen. And God, God opens the doors for different things. You jump in between marketplace ministry to full-time ministry. And like I said, full-time ministry is in the marketplace. You've got to go to where the people are at to get them to come to what, what you're doing. They don't just and show I, up to your tent revivals or anything. You have to, we have to put in that and do what God wants amen. us to do. I also want to encourage, man, that, you know, you never know what God is doing when your situation looks crazy because, you know, one minute me and my family uh, over five years ago, no, yeah, about five years ago, we were living in Waco, Texas, and all of a sudden we sell everything and we moved to Oklahoma, not understanding what God was doing, you know, I, I wasn't. I was in a cave in that moment, man. God was breaking religiousness off of me. He, yeah. he was, he was, he was saying, "I want you." I, one cry that I had, people are going to trip out, but one of the cries that I had in that cave was, "God, I just want to be genuine again. I want to go back to that genuine person where I could love people. I wasn't religious. I didn't have all of these agendas, and you know, because we can get caught up in that very easily. But that was my cry, and. You don't realize that God is answering those prayers and he's and he's breaking you and he's taking all that stuff, you know, off of you. But you don't really realize what God is doing till it just is right in your face. And, man, the powerful thing was I came I came to Oklahoma uh, as a ninth grade dropout, third grade reading level, didn't know where I was going to church. Man, the Lord led me to the church we're in now where we are equipped. And, you know, edified to go out and do, you know, the work of the ministry. And I remember my spiritual father was like, hey, won't you come to school? And I'm like, huh, school, you know, and he was like, yeah, I want you to come to school. I see the gift. I see the calling in your life. And I want to help nurture it. I want to help nurture it because you got a lot of passion, man. And you need to be you need to be able to preach the truth. And and so that's when the door of uh uh, Christian Life School of Theology, you know, that is founded by Dr. Ron Cottle. Uh, and I didn't know that I could attend that type of college without any GED or high school diploma. And so here I am, not understand what God is doing, and I'm almost to my bachelor's, man. And this is what I heard the Holy Spirit tell me. He said, I need you to have these degrees because you're going to need them where I'm taking you. And I don't understand the full picture. That's just what he told me. You know, you're going to have to have these things because people won't receive you without them. And I need them to receive you because they need, you know how some people are. They need that piece of paper saying, oh, he has a bachelor's or he has a this. And it, and it doesn't mean nothing. It just shows that I was willing to put in the works to understand the Bible and what they were writing in the historical times. So why I bring all this up is you never know what God is doing until it's right there in front of your face and you move six hours from your home to where there's nobody. And now all of a sudden your wife is doing amazing. I'm in school. God is preparing me for something even greater than where I'm at right now. And so I just want to encourage people, be, be, be patient and trust the process. You're exactly correct. So when one door shuts, another window opens or another door opens and you, you never know what's going to happen. Where, where one cave is one place, you start feeling <laughs> the breeze or you start seeing the light when you're in the cave to know where to go Amen. next. If you're if you're in a, a room full, a room ain't got no doors that won't open, there ain't no windows. 
God's going to make a way for you to either be removed out of that situation or he's going to show grace and make it even better. There's so much in store. And like you're talking about, like, like I was in that same situation where at one point I didn't have the degrees. There were certain things that didn't, couldn't happen without them. And then having them different doors open for different things. It's the same thing with this. It opens different doors to do different things in certain marketplaces and certain uh, different opportunities of what God's going to open the door to be able to move into more effective places that you can't before. But again, at the same point, for those of you that are trying to juggle all the different things that's going to happen, be patient. Above all things, be patient in this. Remove the fear. Amen. Remove the remove the things that are in your life that's causing the hold up, the setback, the if issues. Your testimony is not over. There is a Amen. purpose. There is a plan. There is intention here and what God is going to do. And there is a hope and a plan for your future and what God is going to do next. Brian's story is not finished. Christine's story is not finished. My story is not finished. Regardless of where we are, God's going to move us to that next step, to that next place where he wants us to be. Sometimes it will look in the secular world like a step back. Well, you're not making more money. You're not taking on a bigger role. You're not doing this. You're not this, that, and the other. You're doing exactly what God has called us to to do, to be the hands and feet of what he wants you to do. He wants us to be more abundantly involved with what he wants in our life. And that means sacrifice. That means servanthood. That means taking care of those that are in our lives so they can be blessed in Jesus' name. And when we learn to serve, when we learn to move forward and do what God called us to do, it opens the opportunity to do what he wants. Jesus' marketplace opportunities were servanthood opportunities, opportunities to do what he's called him and his own life to do can happen in a reflection into your life. God wants us to be imitators of himself, of Christ-like character. And when we move into that moment, those doors open up. And the great majesty of Christ comes upon you and you'll see great things. You'll be able to boast your weaknesses, just like those that are involved in martial arts and everything else. Those pain points, those things in your life, they're going to go away. They're going to transform. You're not going to be the same. You listen to this broadcast a year from now, I encourage you, you're not going to be the same. God's going to lead you to that next step. So at this point, Amen. Brian... I'd like for you to just pray for everyone as they're going out for whatever they're doing to prepare for the day or the evening, whenever they're listening to this. Some of them might be walking, running, listening to this in the airport, listening to this in their home or their car. Can, can you call us out? Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this time that, you know, we come together just to speak up on your word and, and what each and every person is doing in their own individual life. Father, I just pray for a hunger. I pray for a thirst, Father God. I pray whoever hears this or are listening to it, Father, that their hunger and their thirst begins to expand in a way that they have never realized that it could expand, that that, that power that you create in us to have passion to do your perfect will, Father, will begin to push the urge to, to inspire, encourage them to be all that you called them to be, Father, right there where they're at, in their communities, in their, in their uh, marketplaces, in their church, Father God. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you're doing something new in each and every one of us, Father, that it's a new wineskin, that it's nothing to do with the old, but it's new, and you are doing it in this time, in this season, Father, that it is the season of the mouth that people need to speak and be vocal about their testimony and about what you're doing, Father God. So we just give you glory. We give you praise that right now, those who are listening are getting a newfound hunger and thirst for your righteousness, Father, and to see others come to repentance, to a change of mind because of the goodness and the kindness that you see in our lives, that they see in our lives, Father, because you are the model of all those things, goodness, kindness, and patience. You are the model, Father. So we just thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Brian. It's been an honor and privilege to spend this, this time with you together and talking with Christine and I about 
just different topics and what God is doing tonight and how testimonies and how our story isn't over and how we can overcome different things. And I'm really excited to see what God's going to do next to your season with school and your new season in Oklahoma. I have friends that are in Oklahoma and I myself, I'm a Texas boy here in Ohio. <laughs> so I'm kind of like you. I've been sent, you know, <laughs> sent to another place yeah. and wonder what's yeah. God going to do next. And I'm looking at my future and what God's going to do with that. And he's going to open the doors. It's going to be an exciting time to see the expectancy and, and the reverence of what Jesus is going to do in Oklahoma and across America through your ministry and those that you touch. Thank you, brother. Honor. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys, man. Thank y'all. You're welcome. God bless. Thank you.